Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thank you for returning and joining me today. And today we will be discussing emotional intelligence. Now, I am here to tell you that emotional intelligence does not exist. <clears throat> and the reason why I'm bringing this uh, uh, up is because I have seen that it is very popular amongst people in general. And specifically, my main, my main uh, my main issue is that it's promoted quite heavily. Uh, I've been noticing it's, pro it's being promoted quite heavily in my church, specifically, and to no surprise, and in churches in general. Um, and out in the actual medical, scientific, psychological world, um, there it, uh, the, the whole idea of emotional intelligence is uh, heavily contested. Um, and not it's it's not any established in any meaningful way whatsoever and we find that usually the reason why people like to go and talk about um, emotional intelligence otherwise known as eq so we talk about uh, uh so in the same way that you have iq which is your intelligence quotient you then people talk about emotional intelligence as uh, eq as your intelligence quotient and that word is actually misleading because there there is no test whatsoever from which you can actually derive an emotional quotient from in the same way that you can do an IQ. So you can go and do an IQ test. And once you've done the IQ test, they can score everything and they can give you a number, 100, 120, whatever the case might be, and you ranked. And then from that, it, it, it allows you a certain amount of predictive power to, to be able to just from that from that score alone, I would be able to predict more or less how well you would do in school, um, uh, whether you will be able to uh, perform well in a job, how quickly you would learn things, and um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, even, interestingly enough, there's a, a high correlation with high expectancy, so IQ is correlated quite well with uh, with good uh, life, uh, longer life expectancy, overall better health, and all these sorts of things, although, although there is a caveat, there seems to be a tipping point <clears throat> where um, you can, uh, or you get to sort of, uh, let's say, a hundred and four IQ of 140, 150, let's say, and the high, and it seems like that is sort of a tipping point that where the higher you go, you are better correlated uh, in terms of life expectancy and health and all of these kinds of things. However, sort of beyond that, so your ridiculously high IQs where you start hitting 160, 170, 180, 190, it's actually quite highly, so or quite common that uh, for to have psychological pro problems in those very, very high IQ uh, uh, sort of realms. Um, and, um, w and interestingly enough, for example, uh, a lot of people have 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 noticed that a lot of autistic people tend to have these ridiculously high IQs. And uh, so a lot of people sort of <clears throat> have the suspicion that, for example, Einstein was somewhat autistic. And, and so we find that there's quite a high correlation. So IQs that are sort of 170 and above, there seems to be quite a high uh, rate of autism of, of people in that high IQ bracket being autistic. So, so with the emotional quotient, um, they're trying to, to, to figure out a way uh, to sort of, or, or talking about uh, how compassionate you are, how friendly you are, can you work well in a group, and all of these kinds of very pro-social types of things. And they say, well, you know, this is a, 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 a emo your emotional intelligence. Now, both EQ as in, uh, in emotional quotient uh, first of all, that is a is a problematic thing because there is no test that you can be given that can give you a quotient that can that can do a sort of a quantitative assessment can give you a score. Here's your emotional quotient. It doesn't exist. It literally doesn't exist. Okay. And second of all, people have tried, but it it, it they fail, um, and then and the results are not consistent, and so on and so forth. Whereas IQ is very very consistent, very very strong, uh, uh, very very strong, very powerful predictions can be made from 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 IQ. Well, you don't get that with emotional quotient tests and stuff like that. So basically, it doesn't exist. And for the 
for the most part is because in a lot of ways people can't agree on what it is they're measuring so you obviously can't get any kind of number or value and you don't even really know exactly what it is you're, me you're measuring what do we include what do we exclude and so on and so forth and second of all the term emotional intelligence is also another problem because for example uh you know they would say that you are very compassionate for example is uh people who are more compassionate have higher emotional intelligence and to use the word intelligence is to then start using a particular word to mean absolutely anything then right so then anything you do well means you have an intelligence in that particular regard and when a word so for example if i take the word cat and i use the word cat to describe not only cats but dogs and rats and cows and whatever the case might be then the word ceases to have any meaningful descriptive value and the word becomes meaningless it tells you nothing right so it is a misuse of the word intelligence because as we know someone who is even relatively simple as someone who's basically just downright dumb can be very very popular for example can be very popular can be very compassionate can be very well liked so for example we find that people that have certain uh, uh, uh birth defects that retard the brain they can they for so take for example your people with down syndrome generally speaking people with down syndrome have very very high compassion they tend to be lovely wonderful people but the fact of the matter is that their intellectual fa faculties are severely impaired and depending on how severe the down syndrome is some of them will never lead a life of independence right they always need someone to look after them and so on and so forth yet they are very they're wonderful people they're very compassionate they're very friendly uh, they're very enthusiastic. They like to help. They like to be around other people. They're very extrovert uh, in a lot of ways. And so we cannot say that this is a kind of intelligence, obviously, because, you you know, people with very high intelligence and people with very low intelligence, all of them, uh, the whole range can be can exhibit these these kinds of properties. Um, however, we do recognize that someone, even if they have a high IQ, if they have a generally really, really, really bad attitude, they will not be as successful as someone who is uh, who has a high IQ and a very, very good attitude. And so, you know, these things need to be explained that obviously IQ isn't the be all and end all of these things. Now, let's quickly, just so you know that I'm not m making things up, let's go to a, a reliable source, right? Uh, Psychology Today. Emotional intelligence uh, refers to the ability to identify, manage one, one's own emotions, as well as the emotions of others, and so on and so forth. All right, I will link it in the description. Generally said to include at least three skills, emotional awareness, ability to identify and name one's own emotions. Uh, so a lot of, you'll be surprised, a lot of people can be feeling something and they won't be able to actually describe what it is they're feeling. Uh, it's actually very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> name one's own emotions and the ability to harness those emotions and apply them to tasks like uh, thinking and problem solving and things like that um yes and no in that regard uh because again if you've got low if you've got you might be very good at these but if you've got a, an, a low iq your ability to to do problem abstract thinking and problem solving is not going to be there right so that that's actually not necessarily the case at all um However, if we're talking about whether you are motivated, right, whether you are well motivated to actually problem solve, then that would include it because you have the motivational aspect. So, for example, if I've got a very high IQ, but I'm really, really lazy, I won't be motiv motivated to do any problem solving, for example, right? Doesn't, but the capacity is still there. I just don't have the emotional uh, uh, reservoir of, uh, of self self-regulation and self-motivation to go and actually do it uh the ability to manage emotions yes all right so uh do you fly off the handle or do you control your emotions and things like that are you volatile in other words it includes regulating one's own emotions and when necessary even being able to cheer up and calm down other people so it's also the skill like if i i see an expression on someone's face uh, i can tell from that expression what the person is feeling and again you'll be very very amazed um one thing that always um that always really really oh, sorry that always really amazes me for example if you go onto youtube if you have 
a very, very strong uh, uh, ability to identify emotions in others, and you go and you go, let's say on Facebook, you will you, you will be able to identify how many photographs of people where the, the expressions of the people are hiding depression, are hiding pain, are hiding disappointment and all that kind of stuff. Yet the amount of people that comment on those photos saying, oh, you look awesome. You look so happy and this and this and this. And someone like me will sit there because I've also investigated something that's called micro expressions. So micro expressions is the study of small inflections in the facial features, right? That give away the person's true emotions, even though they might be trying to hide those emotions. Right. So I have looked into that and I've sort of developed that skill to a certain degree. And in many cases, I look at photos and people are going on and I'm sitting there and I'm like, how is it that no one can see that this person is suffering horribly from either depression or is sad or whatever the case might be? The person in this photo is not happy and people don't see it. And people absolutely don't see it. And I'm sure a lot of us have experienced where we go out in the world and we feel a particular way and it seems like no one notices that no one notices that uh, you you know even though i feel bad and i say uh, maybe i'm i'm okay or whatever and it seems like no one can notice that i'm lying to them right and a lot of people are out there that wish that uh, uh they could be open or whatever the case might be but they feel like even if they open up to people people don't have the emotional resources uh to be able to respond appropriately and therefore, a lot of people, rather than express themselves in an emotional, uh, say what they're feeling or thinking, they rather just not do it at all because they can't be bothered to put up with the frustration. And that is all a question of emotional, of the whole, what, what the whole emotional intelligence thing is trying to get at. Okay. Um, so here again, and they, and they validate what I said, there is currently no valid test or scale for emotional intelligence. It just doesn't exist as there is for G. G is general intelligence factor and general intelligence is what IQ tries, uh, tries to, to, to measure. So IQ is trying to measure G or, or G stands for general intelligence and IQ measures it very, very, very well, not 100%. Okay not and there's there's reasons for that and it's not a 100 percent, but it is a very good one so it's damn close right it's 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 near as damn it as they say in the uk right um a fact that's led many to say that concept is sketchy or entirely non-existent despite the criticism however emotional intelligence or emotional quotient as it's sometimes has wide appeal among the general pub uh, the general public Right. So basically has wide appeal amongst people who don't know better. Right. Um, as well as certain. Now, here's a problem. Certain interest industries in recent years, some employers have even incorporated an emotional intelligence test into their application or interview process. Now, here's the here's one thing. Here's one thing that really, really irritates me. It is illegal in some places to administer an IQ test. Right in 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 if you are hiring it's illegal to administer an iq test because it's a whole discrimination stupidity right now obviously you wouldn't want someone who was dumb performing a surgery surgery okay which is why you then have the university system because if the person the university system kind of weeds out dumb people right sort of thing but in other situations you can't really so for example let's say you want a secretary right you want the smartest secretary that you could possibly get. You don't want someone who is an idiot. Okay. And, but you're not allowed. Now here's what irritates me. Industries and companies out there are administering emotional, emotional intelligence tests, which are not valid. So you could either gain or lose a job according to something that's completely invalid. Yet the one thing that is valid is, is illegal to administer, which is bloody idiotic. OK, it's it really it gets my goat when I see this kind of stupidity going on. Right. And most and so so it, it really is. And so when companies are then hiring people, they're finding that they're getting some that it's basically luck of the draw. They don't actually really know what they're getting. And the whole thing is failing. Right. Um, to the applicant on the theory that someone high in emotional intelligence would make a better leader. That's false. 
or a coworker or whatever the case might be. But while some studies have found a link and that in job others have shown no correlation and a lack of scientifically valid scale makes it difficult to truly measure or predict. So it's, it's invalid. It is absolutely invalid. Emotional intelligence, emotional, it does not exist. Right. Now, that being said, we must ask, is there a test out there by which I can assess a person's emotional capacity or interpersonal capacity? The answer is yes. And I've already spoken about it in other videos. It is called a personality test, right? When you're looking for a person's ability to socialize, be self-motivated, etc., etc., every single one of those things, when you're talking about these things, whether a person is compassionate, whatever the case might be, you're talking about a person's personality. You're not talking about an intelligence. You're talking about a personality. And the big five trait test where you go agreeableness, extroversion, openness, and so forth, right? That is where all of these things can then be measured. A test can be administered and you can get a quantitative value where the person stands on these scales. So for example, I go and I do the test. I answer a battery of questions. And it's very reliable. So for example, you can generate a battery of, let's say, a thousand different questions, divide them up into uh, 10 different sets of 100, right? And you can reliably administer. Uh, so you give one test to a person and they can do that test. And then you give another battery, uh, another 100, and then another 100, then another. And you do this with people all over the place in different countries, different cultures and stuff like that. And people will reliably measure exactly the same on all the tests in all countries, no matter what your race or all your gender, whatever the case might be, will reliably score within a certain small margin of error, reliably across the whole battery of tests. And from that, you can then get a quantitative value. So I can say you score in the 10th or the 50th percentile in agreeableness. And from that score, whether you are in the 10th of agreeableness percentile or the 80th percentile of agreeableness, from that, I have very, very powerful predictive cap cap uh, capacity to know what kind of person this person is going to be in certain types of situations. And so we can actually have a look at that and we can go through that very quickly here, right? So here are the five factors. We have agreeableness, we have conscientiousness, we have neuroticism, we've got extroversion, and we've got openness, okay? Now, when we talk about a, 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 a super... Uh, a superset i don't i believe i can't remember what the term is uh so basically if we group these together right we can reliably measure we can reliably tell so openness conscientiousness and neuroticism right together gives you a value and that value from that value so you get the score right if, if the person's 50th percentile, 70th percentile, 10th percentile, whatever, you add them together, you divide them by three, you get a score. And that score will be your stability, otherwise known as your emotional stability, okay? And from that, I will be able to predict whether a person is reliably emotionally stable, right? And that means, do they fly off the handle easily? Are they patient? Uh, are they easily offended? Um, or do they always believe other people are talking behind their backs or they paranoid um and so on and so forth do do they fall into depression very very easily i will be able to predict that just, just from knowing those three you get a stab you get a stability assessment right and then extroversion and openness together gives you plasticity right plasticity is the brain's capacity for being adaptable uh how quickly can you learn something new how open are you to new experiences and learning new things and uh, seeing things from different perspective? Uh, so are you open to new experiences? Extroversion. Um, do you, do you, uh, in a, so for example, an extrovert is someone that likes being sociable, likes being out amongst other people. And what a lot of people don't realize is that to be out amongst other people requires quite a high, high degree of, 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 um, mental plasticity because 
uh, human beings are fluid. The situations change and someone who is very, very good at social interactions will be able to move with the flow of what's happening socially and therefore be very, very, uh, uh, very successful socially. And you find that people that are very, very low in that capacity, so they're very rigid, you find that they don't, they become very awkward in social situations. They don't get innuendos and they're not flexible in that sense, right? Um, so for someone that is uh, a very high in extroversion, you can be doing one thing and then you can say, hey, why don't we go and do that? And they'll be, yeah, oh, cool. And you know, whereas someone who's very, uh, who's who doesn't have high plasticity, oh no, but we're doing this and we must only do this now. And if you want, we can schedule to do that some other time. They can be a bit rigid. And then openness, uh, uh, you know, openness is again, plasticity, your ability how interested are you in learning? So your mind, how does uh, does your mind adapt very well to new circumstances, new information? Does it incorporate it very well, and so on and so forth? Um, and and you figure out new ideas. So, for example, people who are very high in openness tend to be almost universally. The higher you are in openness, uh, you're going to be all the people who are inventors, for example, all the entrepreneurs, are all very, very high in openness. They're the ones who are inventing new things all the time. Uh, they're the they're the crazy wing nuts, the scientists who make new discoveries are those people who are constantly investigating and wanting to know because they're curious philosophers and and, and things of that sort. Right now. So, for example, we talk about uh, uh, we want to talk about, oh, if someone is very compassionate, right? We want to say, let's measure compassion, right? I want to be able to measure how compassionate is someone. That falls under agreeableness because agreeableness breaks down, right? So agreeableness breaks down into two subsets, right? And the subsets are C and P, compassion and politeness, okay? Compassion, so for example, if you're measuring, if your person is very high in agreeableness, let's say in the 80th percentile, you will know immediately that that person will be very compassionate and also very polite straight away. You, you know that straight away. I don't even have to know anything about you. All I need to know is that score and I will know straight away whether you're compassionate, whether you are compassionate or not. And now from that score, even if I know nothing about you, interestingly enough, even if I know nothing about you, if you score in the 80th percentile in compassion, in, in agreeableness, I will be able to predict with a 75% accuracy whether or not you vote Democrat or whether you vote Republican. Because most people that vote Democrat are high in agreeableness, right? And makes sense because the Democrat, what is the Democrat position more often than not? Let's give people welfare. Let's look after people. Let's let's give everyone money. Like give everyone money. Everyone is wonderful, <laughs> right? Isn't that exactly what people on the left typically are? Oh, we're for justice and we're for compassion and we're for all that kind of stuff. Straight up, straight away, you can know with about a 75% accuracy, you will know whether that, which way that person's going to vote quite, quite reliably. 75% is a hell of a, co a correlation, right? So you get a fantastic measure, right? Now it's possible that you can be low on, you can be low on compassion, but high in politeness, right? So typically men are low in compassion, but high in politeness. So for example, right? So men, uh, you know, the, the gentleman, I'm very polite and I'm very, you know, I I observe social protocols and social whatever and stuff like that. So, for example, for those of you that have watched uh, Big Bang Theory, right? Think about Sheldon Cooper, right? Sheldon Cooper is very polite and, you know, he's everything is very proper. He's very rigid, but he's really, really disagreeable and very low in compassion. He doesn't really care about he doesn't care about other people at all. Right at all <laughs> sort of thing so someone like sheldon cooper would be predictively very very high in politeness because he's very about very thank you and please and all these kinds of things but very very low in compassion right doesn't care about other people is very very self-absorbed only thinks about himself uh doesn't particularly care about other people right so sort of, and that's and generally you will find that women reliably higher in compassion than men are or, which is why most 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 nurses are, are women, for example. Um, and again, because men are low in com generally low in compassion, it explains why most surgeons are actually there is a high, a very high prevalence of psychopaths or sociopaths in uh, p professions 
of surgeons, right? Because you have to really, when you're going, but as a surgeon, you're basically going to cut someone up, right? You're going to cut some, you have someone on the table, you're literally going to cut them up and go and move things around. And so you, you, you have to be able to dissociate, to dissociate yourself to quite an extent, um, uh, because you have to be clinical about what you're doing right you go in and get the job done and no right you can't in certain situations you can't afford to be overly compassionate because then your compassion will actually get in the way and which is generally why you find that the majority of surgeons like those who actually go and perform perform surgeries open people up and stuff like that are men and then predictably if you find even though women generally are higher in compassion you will find that predictably uh, uh, women who are surgeons are are lower than the average woman in compassion. You will find quite predictively that that's to, for that to be the case. Right, then you want to say, um, we want to predict uh, people who are uh, hardworking, self-motivated, right? They don't need supervision. They follow the rules, right? They follow the rules. They're honest. Uh, 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 you know, they're very on the straight and narrow. Very on the straight and narrow. Immediately, you can predict someone who's conscientious. Straight away, if someone is high, let's say in the 80th percentile conscientiousness, I know immediately without knowing who they are, I will know that that person, if I employ them, they will work hard. Straight up. They will work hard. They will do overtime. And they're going to, they're the, the people who are very high in conscientiousness are the type of people who are nose to the grindstone and off they go, right? Need very little supervision and so on and so forth. However, if I want to know whether someone is, is prone to addictive behavior, right? So does the person uh, 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 demonstrate that they have either high self-control or low self-control? I will, again, I will know immediately from, from this. So for example, someone who's very, very low in conscientiousness, let's say the 10th percentile in conscientiousness, I will immediately know that impulse control is non-existent. So for example, in the lower percentiles of conscientiousness, let's say from perhaps the 20th percentile down, that's where you'll find most of the alcoholics and most of the drug addicts. Most of the drug addicts you will find in those small and most of the criminals is low conscientiousness. And again, we know that more often than not, men are lower in conscientiousness than women are, which explains why most, why the majority of people in prison are men, right? And ma the majority of people who are either addicted to drugs, alcoholics, or in prison are men. And men reliably score low in conscientiousness. But here's the catch, very interesting. Conscientiousness breaks down into industriousness, I and O, all right? Industriousness and orderliness. Men reliably score higher than women in industriousness, which is why most business owners are men, because industriousness is the, sub, is the subset which predicts someone who, who becomes a workaholic, so almost addicted to, be, to work, basically, right? So most workaholics people who do nothing but work are men so reliably we know that most ceos are going to be men so basically any job that requires you to do 90 to 100 hours a week <laughs> have no social life whatsoever at all you do literally nothing but work you know nothing but work is going to be people who are high in conscientiousness specifically high in industriousness people who do nothing but work right which is why reliably predictively most men tend to be in those positions of power not because it's a position of power but because those positions of power require that you will that you work almost all the time you almost never have holiday or you just you work like a dog basically right but Women are higher in orderliness, which is why usually you find women in administrative roles because they're highly higher in orderliness. Now, here's an interesting thing. Conscientiousness seems to regulate disgust. Okay, so do you easily feel disgusted by things, whether something is dirty, whether you're maybe perhaps a bit of a germaphobe and so on and so forth? 
again, reliably predictive, someone who's higher in conscientiousness, specifically orderliness, will be highly, highly discussed sensitive. Now, here's the interesting thing. Most, right, and we say that women on average are higher in conscientiousness than men. Conscientiousness predicts whether you will be, uh, uh, predicts anorexia, for example right? Most anorexics, so whilst in the low conscientiousness area, you have drug addicts and alcoholics, which is mostly men, on the high end of, of, of uh, conscientiousness, with, where now it's getting ridiculously high, you have women who are overachievers, right? And, mo and a lot of them are anorexics, because it's that, it's that sense of perfection, things have to be just so. And a lot of them tend to become anorexics. Um, most anorexic women most every single anorexic woman that I've ever known and I'm pretty sure I know more anorexic women than most of you because I do charity work for example I do charity work and I do sort of counseling and stuff like that in the church and things like that I have never known an anorexic who was not high in conscientiousness I've never met one okay I'm not saying there aren't any but I would be very very surprised if I if I ever met an anorexic person who was low in conscientiousness specifically ordinance or and if you talk to anorexic woman they will tell you that in a lot of ways the anorexic person when they talk about themselves they use language of disgust they will say I'm disgusting I'm ugly I feel repulsed I feel and stuff like that and this is why <laughs> interestingly enough if you are a man, this is why women prefer men who are well-groomed. So even though women may like their men rugged, for example, rugged doesn't mean dirty. Women don't like dirty men. <laughs> Which is why if you are a man and you approach a woman, right, the last thing you want to do which is why you have to dress up look after yourself make sure you if you have a beard make sure it's neat and tidy and so on and so forth because if you disgust a woman that is the sure way the sure way <laughs> to make to uh, the, she will reject you straight up right because women on average are very and much higher in disgust sensitivity than men again which is why women generally you don't find women in plumbing right try and find a female plumber because it's it's a disgusting job you don't find women in those professions even surgery surgery can be a pretty disgusting job right you don't find many women in 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 surgery however you do find a lot of women in nursing right interestingly enough and nursing can be a very disgusting job however the high compassion helps a lot of women overcome their disgust sensitivity in order to help because it's a more in personally you get more attached to the individual it's more human humanitarian in a sense right so it's very very interesting these these dynamics right so this is very very you can, as you can see we don't need to measure emotional intelligence and and emotional and all that nonsense personality trait theory does all of it and when you account for IQ and emotional and emotional uh, and and personality then there's almost nothing left to be explained the, basically right now here's the thing again industriousness if you have someone with an iq of 150 i mean now this person is a is a genius is an absolute genius but if they're low in industriousness they're lazy so they will not realize their full potential okay which is why iq alone isn't everything and so it is better it is actually better for you to be uh average to slightly above average iq yet be highly industrious than to have a ridiculous iq and be low in industriousness lazy right because it's better to be a fully optimized iq of 110 than to be a completely inefficient iq of 150 right which explains why some people uh, because a lot of people have, I, I get this sometimes, it's this ignorance like, oh, if this person has got high intelligence, why haven't, why aren't they working in university and inventing space rockets and things like that? And the explanation is why is because not everyone with a high IQ has high conscientiousness and therefore they don't work. They're not interested in working hard enough to achieve those kinds of things because the their, their, their industriousness and the orderliness is just too low, right? Neuroticism, again, if I want to know whether... So 
the lower you are in neuroticism the more the more emotionally stable you are the better you are so the more chilled out you are um so for, for example high uh, high neuroticism and low neuroticism the lower you lower you are in neuroticism the less you experience anxiety the less you in, experience mood swings the less you experience uh, paranoid thoughts, the less you experience fear and all of these kinds of things. So for example, if you have a neuroticism score of like five the, in the fifth percentile, if someone comes up to you and says, you're a moron, you'll be like, yeah, all right. And it will literally mean nothing to you. However, if your neuroticism is at a hundred and someone says, you are a wonderful person, you are still be offended because you will be suspicious of them because they said something. So again, right? Like for example, if we look uh, at modern day, we we understand that out in the world with all of these social justice warriors and all these activists, we understand we have come to realize something that is known as victim culture, right? The victim culture and the outrage culture. So people who constantly going on about how victimized they are and how about how terrible their lives are and people who are, are outraged and offended by absolutely everything under the sun right those people are high neuroticism and we know right we know that and we understand why that is happening in society because as you have the breakdown of the family unit you reliably start seeing an increase in neuroticism among the general population which is then why you have the issue the social issues that you do right so the vast majority of so predictably if a person is a social justice warrior are almost almost 100 percent predictive that they're high neuroticism high in agreeableness low in conscientiousness almost straight away because uh one thing that people have noticed about social justice warriors is most of them are unemployed <laughs> right and they have absolutely no impulse control whatsoever they go out and they rage out completely uh they've got no emotional um no emotional ability to emotionally regulate so those people so like when trump when trump won the elections those people who are literally screaming and crying and lim as if they as if they were going to die on the streets those are all your those are all the people who are low in conscientiousness so there's no impulse control there's no ability to regulate regulate emotions or anything like that high neuroticism that means they're high in volatility uh so they're up and down all over the place one minute they're one thing next minute they're another thing um and so neuroticism breaks down into volatility and withdrawal so again something that you find with a lot of people who experience depression is they withdraw from society right into themselves you ask a person how are you doing uh you know uh, and they don't really want to tell you so if they're very w withdrawn they keep to themselves and whatever the case might be you know they're high in uh, uh they're not you know they're high in withdrawal and therefore high neuroticism so the higher you are in neuroticism i can predict whether your chances of of suffering um uh depression so for example i have never ever in my entire and believe me i know a lot of depressed people i have never met a person who was suffering from depression that was not extremely high in trait neuroticism straight up if you're suffering from anxiety if you're suffering from fear if you uh all of these kinds of things depression uh feelings of uh low self-worth all of these kinds of things means you are, 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 are high in neuroticism, straight up. And if you are low in neuroticism, so you're chilled, you're easygoing, nothing phases you. So you've got to... So low neuroticism means you've got a thick skin, basically. People with thick skin are low in neuroticism, straight up, right? They, they're chilled out, they're not phased. So basically someone, someone with zero neuroticism person i don't think such a person exists right because everyone is worried has worries and concerns right but people who are as close to zero as possible are like the, the literally the world could end and they'd be chilled about it sort of thing so it's a an inherent the and by the way these are set by at birth biologically you're there right and how you are raised right so how you are raised and disciplined will determine how you balance these things out. So for example, if you are high in neuroticism, then your mission in life is to balance that out. Because here's the thing, right? 
high neuroticism has its benefits for so for example women they talk about their sixth sense when they can sense there's something wrong and they can just tell that something is off and that's a pretty and that's a good thing because a lot of the time they're right okay but that's because they have that sensitivity to danger and fear and anxiety but if it goes overboard it means that 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 uh, it can get to the point where that anxiety and depression and fear completely ruins their life so they're too afraid to even do anything right yet for someone who is uh, very very low in neuroticism when they they're then they're not afraid when they should be afraid and then that can be a problem so it's all about balance it's all about balance however of all of these the one the dimension with the most detriment is tends to be neuroticism uh there's almost there's almost there's practically zero value benefit being higher than about 40th 50th percentile in neuroticism um anything higher than that then your your neuroticism is is almost taking over your life uh in in a lot of ways with a lot of people it's 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 rough it's really 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 rough so for anyone who's suffering depression and stuff like that you can know that it's not just in your head right um, and then your neuroticism can either be made better or worse, depending if you had a rough upbringing, whatever the case might be, will 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 increase or decrease this, and will how much you deal. Which is why you cannot you cannot molly coddle your children. You cannot your children ha when your children are growing up, they have to experience failure, they have to experience pain, they have to experience these things because it is during those formative years that they learn how to deal with these issues right so if you're a helicopter parent you need to stop right now because your child is not developing the skills to deal with negative emotions right so then uh, we want to talk about extroversion again so people uh, uh, how good are you socially right so extroversion breaks down into assertiveness and ex and uh, and enthusiasm right a assertiveness e enthusiasm right is a person happy go lucky they or they they're down for anything right that's a, that's enthusiasm they're down you can rely on that so do you have that friend who you could literally call at three o'clock in the morning and say dude let's go and do whatever <laughs> let's pack up our bags and go right that'll be a person who's high in enthusiasm right they'll go let's they're game for anything no problem okay assertiveness so all of your leaders all of your leader you cannot be a leader if you don't have high assertiveness because people will walk literally they will walk all over you okay so donald trump assertiveness 90th plus percentile easy easy for example right that way he's got barack obama same thing massively ridiculously high assertiveness these are confident people so assertiveness is the confidence dimension so the higher you are in extroversion the more confident and the more dominant you are the lower obviously then the less dominant and the less confident you are so that that can be a sort of you know sort of thing but then obviously has its it's pros and cons so if you're very dominant means you can tread on people's toes easily if uh, but if you're not confident enough it means that you get pushed around and you're easily bullied right so a lot of the time when you talk about when you're looking at issues like at school about people being bullied whatever the case might be predictively reliably the people who are being bullied are people who are on the low end of the spectrum straight up and the people who are doing the bullying will be people who are low in low in this low in that and high and generally speaking somewhere in the middle to high of of this sort of thing and interestingly enough if you actually confront a bully, the reason why i say they're not all the way up is because bullies are not they 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 a lot of that assertiveness is fake so but you know in order to even feign bullying someone else at all it is a it is a domineering thing so they will be sort of round about the middle but not particularly high right sort of thing so the idea that people are very assertive of bullies all the our make up all the bullies is actually not true because with bullying there's a lot of fake assertiveness there and a lot of the times um a lot of the times the person is doing that because they are making up for their lack of assertiveness when it actually counts 
And so then they're taking out that frustration on someone who's lower, uh, low, a lower assertiveness than they are, sort of thing. So, for example, myself, uh, extroversion, I'm in the, I think I'm in the 98th percentile for extroversion. I was never bullied. Uh, there were people, <laughs> there were people that tried, but it didn't work. It never worked. You just, you couldn't push me around, sort of thing. So, predictably, right, if you, if you, uh, anyone who knows that who I am, right, if you told them, where does Morgan fall under here, they would immediately tell you, he's, he's high, predictably, predictably, right? Um, and enthusiasm, I'm game for whatever the case might be. Here, interesting thing, again, men are higher in assertiveness, although, on average, women are higher in overall extroversion. Men, on average, are still higher in assertiveness than women are, which is, again, why the vast majority of time, leaders are men because they're higher in assertive. They simply have more confidence. And you have to have, if you don't have confidence in a, le a leadership position, you'll be ripped to pieces, completely ripped to pieces. And also because men on average are lower in neuroticism because they're, you can't be high neuroticism and then high. These two are actually polar opposites, right? And there's actually, you can actually tell, you can actually look at the, at a person's brain and see the density in the two uh, in the two hemispheres, depending on where it is. I think it's the orbital front of cortex, if I'm not mistaken. The density of the neurons will tell you. So low density, you tend to find, um, if I'm not mistaken, high confidence is high density uh, on the left, and is high yeah and then and then uh high neuroticism low confidence and things like that is low density on the right if i'm not mistaken so even the brain density uh the the density of the neural material in your brain in between the left and the right uh hemispheres uh just by looking at that you can actually actually predict whether the person even without the personality test you can reliably predict whether the person is going to be high neuroticism prone to depression or whether they're going to be extrovert and assertive and confident and all these kinds of things so this is a very 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 sound physiological scientific basis stuff like that uh, a lot of work has gone into this for and we've been doing for decades research on this i mean started back in back in the in in the early in the early 20th century already sort of thing they were already doing this right um so reliably that's uh, so, and i know and a lot of women complain oh we need more female leaders and da, 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 that but when you go and look for the female leaders where are they you don't find them because a lot of the women if you are low in, in, in assertiveness you can't be bothered to be a leader and sort of but and here's the interesting thing right high assertiveness is not a predictor of whether a person wants to be a leader or not. So, for example, I'm ridiculously high in assertiveness and, and I'm also fairly high in conscientiousness, right? I have all of the right personality traits to be a leader, yet I could not care less about being anyone's leader. I, no, I don't want it. I do, I do not like leadership positions. Can't be bothered with it. Right. Um, a lot of people sort of, for example, they want to be at the top of the hierarchy and, you know, they want to, you know, be the most popular or be the one and have everyone admire them and all that kind of stuff sort of thing. For me, I can't I actually can't imagine anything worse. Right. So I'm sort of the type of person that prefers to be outside of the dominance hierarchy rather than within the dominance hierarchy. I can't be bothered. I, I couldn't care less. I don't want it. Just leave me alone, which is actually which is actually a uh, uh, sort of counterintuitive if you consider how high my extroversion is because 90, 98% overall, I mean, sort of the sort of 97th uh, extroversion overall, and then uh, assertiveness, I mean, about the 98th, and then extroversion, I mean, sort of the 80 something, which again, because women on average are higher in, in uh, enthusiasm, much higher enthusiasm, which is generally why they're a lot more cooperative than men are, right? But so, so women on average are very, very high in enthusiasm. And so for me to be so high in, in, in enthusiasm is actually highly atypical. So in, in terms of enthusiasm, I'm actually more like a female than I am actually like a man. 
for uh, uh, for example so much more and I have found that in a lot of ways um, in, uh, in yeah actually in a lot of ways I actually get along better with women than what I do with men okay um, and then last but not least we have openness again if you want to talk about someone who is is creative and they like poetry and they like literature or they like scientific investigation to explore and all these kinds of things right they're philosophical they like music well all these kinds of things all here it's all here you don't have to go and uh, look so uh, you know emotional no no intelligence no nothing involved that is although interesting like that interestingly enough of all of these personality traits the one that correlates the most with intelligence with IQ is actually openness interestingly enough I think the correlation is about 0.3 so it's not a massive con correlation right but it it is the most strongly correlated with openness because obviously if you're not high in openness and you're a dum-dum you're not gonna you can be as open to experience as much as you want but you're not going to be inventing you're not going to be the next Steve Jobs inventing things right or whatever the case might be because these are where the entrepreneurs are for example right all the entrepreneurs the philosophers the painters the poets and all that kind of stuff although um in the modern industry so if you look at the the vast majority of of popular level music today it's utter garbage utter absolutely utter utter just mentally retarded garbage right Nicki Minaj Beyonce uh, what's that what's that other fool who thinks he's Jesus uh, I can't even remember his name um, a lot of that you listen to the lyrics and they're brainless right so to be successful at at those kinds of creativity these days does actually not require a lot of openness anymore music used to so back in the days where you, where lyrics actually where the lyrics of the of a song actually meant something profound right lyrics you back in the 80s <laughs> and prior maybe as far as up to the 90s right may it was sort of maybe during during the 90s that the transition that it all started going downhill but once upon a time lyrics used to mean something right we've all seen that meme that goes around comparing freddie mercury to beyonce right that girls run the world mentally retarded song literally she just says for the whole song girls run the world girls run the world meanwhile compared to compared to freddie mercury there's these lyrics it's profound there's there's something there right <laughs> whereas <laughs> we've all seen that meme go around right the lyrics the lyrics are completely demented right personally i believe there's an agenda there that music is one of the avenues which is being used to dumb down and retard the average population but that's another conspiracy for another day sort of thing um by the way those of you that know me right you've seen that i that i've got no problem saying that someone's a retard that someone's a moron that someone is stupid right what would you predict is my personality here so let's say what would you predict my agreeableness to be <laughs> right if i'm willing to i've got no problems calling someone an idiot and if they feel sad about it i could care less right you would reliably predict that so even by watching my videos you would be able to reliably and you paid attention you'd be re reliably predict where i would i would fall on these kinds of things so agreeableness i'm i'm moderately low in agreeableness so i still have a lot of compa i'm actually more compassionate than the average man interestingly enough i think i'm the 40 something percentile whereas the average man is about 35 35th 36th percentile i'm at the 43rd per percentile right and which explains why i'm doing these videos right because uh, I care to a degree enough about other people that I take the time to explain these things to provide a public resource or something like that but I don't care so much that I'm not willing to tell you that you're being an idiot when you're being an idiot right whereas a person who's high in compassion who's very very high in compassion you can you can virtually treat them like a doormat and they'll do nothing to you right they'll let you get away with it which is again one of the problems so uh, on that side of the of of so on the high side of agreeableness are the doormats and the gullible what people and on the low side of the of the 
of this side are the people who will tell you like it is uh and they're very very different they're not gullible they're not difficult to uh it's difficult to take advantage of them sort of thing which by the way this is why con artists right confidence men con artists on average they go for women and for for old people because the older you get and interestingly enough the older you get the higher your 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 agreeableness increases with age right um and that's why con artists for the most part con artists tend to be men because in order to con someone you have to be low in agreeableness okay and who's your victim going to be? Your victim is going to be anyone who's high in agreeableness because someone who's high in agreeableness is not naturally suspicious, right? So, which means who are your victims going to be for the most part? They're going to be women and old people. And we know that most of the time people who fall for scams, people who fall for con artists tend to be women and old people right all these email scams and stuff like that most of the time you're constantly hearing about some old person right out there who fell for it and gave their life savings to some idiot that ran away with the money and more often than not it's an old person and more often than not it's a female old person okay so these are very very reliably predictive and then who's the per and reliably predictive who's the con man the con man more often than not is a man right which again we said most of the people in prison are men They're, who's the most criminal men because they're reliably low in con low in agreeableness and low and reliably low in conscientiousness so these two right if you go to any if you go to any country and you take personality traits let's say you go and you do a hundred thousand personality traits right and you get and you get the average for that particular country or a particular state or a particular town whatever the case might be and you tell me what is the average agreeableness and conscientiousness in that town or that state or that country i will immediately be able to tell you how high the crime rate is straight away straight away right straight up so that's the predictive power right that's the predictive power of so everyone in prison everyone in prison all the men in prison will be low conscientiousness low agreeableness straight up and in a lot of ways a lot of them will be high high neuroticism right stability problem so low agreeableness low conscientiousness high neuroticism makes for an unstable person and all of those all of those people are in prison or on the street right medication and stuff like that because the men who are in prison are emotionally first of all they're antisocial so there's the withdrawal aspect and then they're, they're they're violent and stuff like that which is the volatility aspect right even though women are generally higher in neuroticism but when you get a but men are, are generally lower in those two so even though women tend to be higher in neuroticism you don't get them committing crime as much because they're still reliably higher in conscientiousness and higher in agreeableness so this is very very powerful if you want to know the emotional uh, state or the emotional capacity is a person kind kind caring hard working um, uh, whatever the case might be right you can administer this personal a big five personality test and you can predict straight away so if you run a company right if you run a company don't give these stupid emotional in intelligence they're not going to work they're going to fail you what you want is an IQ test and a personality test, right? If the person has an IQ of 180, but has got a, a conscientiousness of 10 and an agreeableness of 10, you don't want them. You don't want, it doesn't matter how intelligent they are, you don't want them because they're going to be nothing but trouble. Nothing but trouble, right? It would be better to get someone who is uh, IQ of 110 or 120, with a conscientiousness of 70 or 80 and an agreeableness of an agree agreeableness of about 40 50 around there you know you generally speaking you don't really want someone who's too agreeable because someone who's too agreeable is um is how can you say they're gonna want even though it's there's nothing wrong with making friends with your co-workers someone who's very very high in agreeableness is going to get involved in everyone's business because everyone and they uh, everyone is there 
they're gonna try to mother everyone and and then you you've, you've got a person who's just gonna you know irritate people in general and also someone who's you, you want someone who's extrovert but you do, again you don't want someone who's too ridiculously extrovert because if they're very very high in extroversion they're going to be that person who's constantly work walking around talking to everyone all the time and doing no work whatsoever right you want extroversion because obviously you want someone that can get along with people obviously you want that right but not too much because then the guy's ne the guy's never going to get work done and uh he's constantly talking to people and walking around and or you're having a chat right sort of thing so these are how you can and if you have a good understanding right and knowing this you can then even you can then even find out even specific jobs within the country uh within the country within the company will have specific per personality profiles that best suit so for example if you're looking at, for a manager you want a manager that's not too agreeable because a manager has to hire, has to fire, has to make tough decisions, has to discipline the people who are under them. So you want someone who is, first of all, not too agreeable because then the people that they're managing are going to walk all over them. They're going to be completely ineffective because every, people will literally get away with murder. Right. But also, you don't want someone who's too disagreeable because who's too much of a son of a gun son of a cross-eyed camel why because then they're going to do nothing but upset people and then they they will tend to be unfair they were going to be uh, uh they're going to be overly keen on disciplining people and and firing people so if you're looking for someone for a leadership position you actually want someone who is uh who whose agreeableness is let's say at about between sort of 40 40 to 60 more or less sort of thing uh, depending on what kind of role and stuff like that it is and then but who's high in conscientiousness because someone who's high in conscientiousness is more likely to be fair right and you don't want and again you don't want someone who's high in neuroticism because that person is going to be is going to be volatile uh, and is going to be unreliable in that way and so sort of thing you know, so you wouldn't want that kind of person manager managerial position. However, if you had someone, if you're looking for a computer programmer, computer programmer is going to be the type of person who's just going to sit in front of that computer and write and just write software all day. And so it's not a particularly social job. It's not a particularly uh, elegant or whatever the case might be. So essentially what you want is someone. It's, so it doesn't matter if that some person is low in agreeableness because they're dealing with a machine, not with people. It doesn't matter if they're low in extroversion because, again, you don't need them to deal with people. They're just dealing with a machine. But you want someone who's high in conscientiousness because programming takes a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of focus it takes a lot of hours so you want someone who's very hard working and all that kind of stuff and again you want someone who's low in neuroticism because with a lot of programming stuff there's often very very tight deadlines and there's problem solving and stuff like that. someone who's high in volatility uh, who's high neuro is just going to give up right so you want someone who's got a high stress uh, stress threshold and so that's how you can you see these things so if you want to know right Forget about emotional intelligence. Forget about emotional quotients. It does not exist. It's useless. It doesn't exist. And you're going to make mistakes if you try to use it. If you want to know a person's suitability for a particular place in your company or a particular compatibility with you as an individual and so on and so forth, go for personality. Go Definitely go do it. And even yourself. If you are an individual and you want to know a bit more about yourself, go and do a personality personality test. I will link uh, uh, access uh, to a personality test. I'll put it in the description below. So you can go and do a personality test and you can see. But you need to be honest. It's not going to help you if you're not honest. Because one of the weaknesses of personality reports, of personality uh, uh, uh assessment is that it is self-reporting right so if you're going to go and do a personality test make sure you're not hungry because if you're hungry you're going to be overly critical of yourself make sure you're not rushed make sure you take to your time to do it make sure you're honest and if you're unsure about something sometimes it helps for you to get other people 
that you trust to do it with you because you might think that you're more of something than you really are or less of something than you really are and the per and the other person who has a, a more objective uh, view of you uh, can then sort of set you straight and say maybe you, you're not quite that much there you're a little bit less here or a little bit more there or they'll know uh, you being a harsh on yourself there maybe you're a bit more there and so so that can actually be quite helpful and then you'll know straight up you're right parents who want to understand their kids what kind of people their kids are so for example for example if you are low in conscientiousness don't go to university you're going to be miserable you're going to be absolutely miserable all right if you're low in conscientiousness and high in openness even though openness is a good entrepreneurial trait you're not going to do well you need to go and do something else maybe do an apprenticeship or you need to you need to find your profession in a different way university and college is not going to do it for you right because university and college is very regimented it's about doing your homework it's about doing it like this and like this and like this and someone who's low in conscientiousness and high in openness is too much of a free spirit they want to do things in their own way uh they you know they're going to hate it they're going to absolutely hate it university is not for everyone uh, contrary to what the social justice warriors would like you to believe that universities everyone's right and everyone should go it's rubbish not everyone should be in university because it just will not suit you're going to be miserable go and do an apprenticeship right in fact for most men so again women tend to be higher in conscientiousness which that's why they do well in university and we see today women are absolutely smashing it in university smashing it whilst men are dropping out <laughs> they're dropping like flies why men on chances are just uh, roll of a dice chances are if if it's a if it's a male he shouldn't really go to university rather go and do an apprenticeship will be because men and women learn in different ways which is why the education system is failing men because the education system is geared towards the way girls learn rather than the way boys learn because boys learn differently right so this is very very reliable very very reliable you can make it the predictive the explanatory and predictive power of personality trait theory is astonishing it's extremely useful extremely extremely useful and if you combine that with iq brilliant the only problem is the idiots in government have decided that you're not allowed to give iq tests to to potential fortunately there are other ways that you can assess iq you know um in in uh just by talking to the person and stuff like that. you can see if the person's switched on or not just by interacting with them and so on and so forth right and just to know how reliable iq is because a lot of people like to poo poo iq and say oh it's racist it's all garbage you know the the u.s military will not take anyone lower than lower than a, an iq of about 83 or 85 that it's illegal they won't do it why because someone with a low iq not only are they absolute not only is it absolutely ridiculously difficult to train someone with that an iq that low but the problem is a person with an IQ that low is more likely to shoot himself or one of his mates than he is to actually be effective on the battlefield. <laughs> That's the unfortunate reality sort of thing, right? We know like the Marines, the Rangers and all those guys, they have a code. What's the code? Leave no man behind. Right now, imagine you've got a bunch of, of dimwits out there who are more inclined to shoot themselves than anything else, right? Now you've got to go back in there because some idiot didn't know how to handle a gun. Go on YouTube. Go on YouTube and you see exactly, go on YouTube and Google uh, um, accidents with guns and you see the abject stupidity of how people shoot themselves with their own firearms. Why? It's low IQ. It's low IQ. That's why those people cannot be in the military because they're a liar, because they're a liability. Right? Again, when it comes to IQ, it's absolutely powerful. You, it's very, very powerful. If you go and if you tell me, what is the I average IQ in X, Y, or Z country? From that alone, I will be able to tell you how stable the country is, how much crime is in that country, and what kind of a government that country has, whether the government, there's ridiculous corruption, whether it's a stable democracy, whatever the case might, I'll be able to tell you, just from knowing the average IQ of the country. Simple as that. We cannot deny these things. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that helps you out. Um, and if you see if you see people talking about EQ and all, you need to 
tell them, listen, that's nonsense. There is a much, much more reliable, it can, you can give you quantitative data and so that you can make a proper quality decisions, right? You can, you can get, so you literally, you go and do it and you get a, a highly, highly quantitative description of what you are. You are the 84th percentile here, the 67th percentile there, da, 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 da and that puts you, that you, you know how you know how to orient yourself and know what what things are about. It's very very accurate, very very good, right? And obviously things are constantly improving. But EQ doesn't exist. It doesn't the reason why people cling to EQ is because um, they've real we've realized that because here's the thing: people poo poo EQ, uh, uh, poo poo IQ, and and uh want to uplift eq even though eq doesn't exist and iq is obviously a thing right it's because of agreeable people because agreeable people don't like to admit that some people are just dumb right and so it's because of this uh it's because of this malignant modern day malignant egalitarianism that wants to say everyone is absolutely perfect no matter what that people cling to something that doesn't exist and want to reject something that does exist because oh it's discriminatory and it's not things are what they are and we just have we have to deal with them right we have to deal with them and the only reason why eq still exists as a theory at all is because people are too agreeable and too egalitarian to just get rid of it and go and move over to something that works and personality trait theory works but it doesn't always tell you things that you like to know for example I was very, very surprised that I was as high in extroversion. Once I started reading about it, I realized, okay, well, that's why. But I was very, very surprised to, to, to discover I thought I was an introvert. I used to think I was an introvert, right? Because I don't like being around other people at all, <laughs> right? For me, the, for me, the perfect weekend is staying home with my wife, chilling out, getting some food, maybe watching a movie, just me and her together, or just myself and maybe... Uh, maybe my 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 brother-in-law and sister, or one or two friends, a very small group. For me, that's that for me that's perfect. For me, the idea of going to like a concert with a thousand people, I cannot imagine anything more painful in my life. Right? I am not a sociable person at all. But I'm a highly extrovert anyway. Highly, 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 highly extroverted, and which means explains that the reason why I'm not so sociable is because even though I'm high in, because all of these things balance each other out, right? Because I'm low in agreeableness, then obviously I'm not inclined to be around other people as much because I'm not as caring <laughs> as other people are, <laughs> sort of thing, you know? I can't, can't, can't be bothered, you know? Because where there's people, there's drama. I remember when I was back in school, uh, I had a group of friends, and whenever drama whenever you know you know how it is in school right in the group and suddenly and the this couple get together and then they break up and then there's blah, 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 and this one is and this there's drama in the group uh, what i used to i can't tell you how many times i'd look at the group i'd say right to hell with all of you i'm gonna go and i'd go off and i'd sit by myself i didn't care i would go off and sit by myself somewhere in the sunshine i'd have my lunch i'd you know bring a pillow or was only to school i'd lie on the grass and i'd chill out and I was there and I was quite happy to be on my own. Either that or I'd go and I, I'd go to the basketball court. And if there was, uh, if there was people there, if the, court, if the court was open, I'd go play basketball. I'd go play football or something like that. And I had absolutely no problem telling my group to get lost sort of thing. No problem. I, did, I can't tell you how many times I did as soon as the drama started, right? And the fascinating thing is that within about three or four days, the members of that group, as they started getting fed up with each other, they'd come find me to come and sit with me wherever I was. And they would vow, because I look at them and say, oh, Morgan, can we come and sit by you? And I look at them and I'll be like, no drama. And be, I swear, I promise, I promise, within about a week, every, everyone that I'd left was now sitting with me again, right? And within another two or three weeks of that, drama would start again, even though they all promised that they would behave and get along with each other, drama would start again, in, and I'd tell them all to get lost again. And this was, this was the cycle at school, right? <laughs> uh, 
so funny good old times good times school was well for me i know that not everyone enjoys school but yeah i had a good time at school let me tell you anyway ladies and gentlemen i hope that helps you out and bring some clarification and uh why i say eq doesn't exist it's not because i'm being arbitrary or being whatever it's because when it's because there's something else that is better that's quantitative that is measurable that is discernible it's got predictive power it's got explanatory scope it's got all of these kinds of things and it's and it and it works excellently whereas emotional intelligence is an absolute hot mess no one can decide on what it is there's no predictive power there's no qualitative assessment there's nothing there's absolutely it doesn't exist it's nonsense and every single every single thing single thing that people talk about way out when they are trying to discuss emotional intelligence and all that kind of stuff can all be explained with reference to personality it's all at the end of the day it all comes down to what is your personality like that simple all right ladies and gentlemen i thank you very much for your viewership god bless and uh cheerio goodbye